Hello, everyone. I'm Angela Taylor, your host for Unlocking the Club. And today I actually want to talk about a email message that I received from a listener that really resonated with me for a few different reasons. Um, the message in essence spoke a little bit about um, how he'd been listening to the podcast and really enjoying the, the conversations that we've had with, with all of our guests for different reasons. So cited a couple of our recent conversations, the conversation with Jasmine uh, Stringer um, in particular, and just talked about how he was amazed at um, people's ability to do different things, um, particularly those things that he um, himself wasn't capable of doing. And uh, one of the things that um, in that moment when I received that email, it is somebody that I know, um, have known for a long time in my life. And I came to um, the thing that, that I know this individual to do really well in a unique way. And um, a trait that he has that no one else that I know um, has it, um, and that's just his memory. His ability to be able to go back into our childhood, you know, decades ago, but no one's counting, and, and recall um, specific moments, who was there, conversations that took place, how people felt, how people looked, um, just a lot of incredible things. Um, and he has this really unique gift of his memory. I think his memory is really powerful because the reason he's able to remember those things is because he's present in those moments. He was present and paying attention to who was there, what was going on, and certainly that ability to recall all of those things. And so his message to me resonated because I think so often many of us look at, what, look at somebody else and their abilities and we admire them for those. And oftentimes we discount our own abilities because we may not have that superpower, because we may not have that skill set or competency, um, we may diminish what we actually have. And um, I've seen that over the course of the last few months as we've been having conversations with our guests who are talking about things such as being brave or being courageous. I think sometimes when we look at others who we think are brave, who are doing things that we never could do, um, if people come to me about this podcast and they just, um, again, are appreciative for, for me creating a platform where we can have these conversations, um, but also say, wow, like, I don't know if I could ever do something like that. It must take a lot of courage. And for some people, what you see them doing, it may not be hard. It actually may be something that they're good at, that they're leaning into, may have some challenges, may, but may not have that same level of fear that you may have. And we interpret it as them being courageous in that moment, doing something that you could never do. Uh, and we don't take that same time to pause and look at all of the things that we have done in our lives and see where we've been courageous, where we've been brave, where we've overcome our own fear. And so I just want to use this as a moment for us all to, again, take the time to reflect on all of your gifts, again, your superpowers, those things that make you special and unique. They may be different than others, people that you admire and respect, people that you look up to, people that you think that are successful or doing things that you wanna be able to do, but don't let that admiration and appreciation obscure what you are doing and what you bring to the table and the gift that you have. And I think it's really important for us all to take the time and the moments to actually evaluate what those gifts may be. I may not be uh, a WNBA superstar, right? That was not my gift as an elite of all elite athletes, um, but I may have other gifts that um, have a really important place um, in this society and hopefully are having the impact um, that um, I'm hoping to, to have with them. And so um, just my thought for today is to unlock that, is we all have our own gifts, we all have our own superpowers. Um, take the time to, to note, name, and notice your own gifts, um, to appreciate them, to celebrate them, and certainly to amplify those as you move forward. Uh, and I certainly look forward to amplifying the gifts that today's guest, Leah B. Olson, has on next episode of Unlocking the Club. Welcome to the Unlocking the Club podcast, where we host honest and direct conversations about journeys of access, personal truth, and reclaiming space. We share our truth so that you can find the key to own your truth, honor your journey, and reclaim your space. 
Grab your keys, your wallet, and your phone, and invite your friends to meet you at the club. Here's your host, Angela Taylor. Today on Unlocking the Club, I will be joined by Leah B. Olson. As a parent, sports broadcaster, and former collegiate student athlete, Leah B. Olson has experienced sports culture from every angle. Since playing basketball for the University of Minnesota, where she studied journalism and mass communication, Leah has worked for ESPN's National Basketball Association coverage and currently is a game analyst for the Minnesota Lynx and a sideline reporter for the Minnesota Timberwolves on Valley Sports North. Founder of the nonprofit Rethink the Win, Leah now champions young athletes as complete people and the positive impacts of sports beyond the game. Leah has been a public advocate for promoting women in the media, served on the Minnesota Twins Community Foundation Board, and served at the invitation of Governor Mark Dayton on the Minnesota State High School League Board. She has also mentored African-American athletes at the University of Minnesota, moderated a civil rights discussion featuring U.S. Congressman John Lewis, and interviewed Bill and Hillary Clinton. She is also a member of the board of directors of Bell Bank, one of the nation's largest and fastest growing family and employee owned banks. Founded in Fargo, North Dakota in 1966, Bell Bank has nearly $10 billion in assets and more than 1,600 employees. Thanks for tuning in as we unlock the club with Leah B. Olson. Leah, thank you so much for joining us today on Unlocking the Club. How are you doing? Hi, Angela. Oh, I'm doing wonderful, and thank you so much. I've been I've been watching, and I'm excited to be on your podcast. It's amazing what you're doing here. Thank you. That means a lot to me. That I know you have a lot on your plate, right? As a mother and a leader and a broadcaster and right a philanthropist. So I appreciate you coming on the show, and I appreciate you listening to the show. You know, we just talked a little bit about the things that you're doing on your bio. What else? I know that you have a myriad of things on your plate. What else um, is on your plate right now? I think right now, probably the thing I'm most excited about is mentoring. And I have been really dialed in right now that I feel like it's my time to kind of give back to young women coming through. And I've been working with a young woman who has been really fabulous to work. We've worked with each other for the last year. And um, we're kind of officially done, but we're staying connected. So I'm trying to think as who is the next person that I can connect with. And I don't know, one of the things I just have found so exciting about mentor the mentoring piece is that you really do get a lot out of it as the mentor. And so um, just kind of seeing where Janae, um, the young woman who I was mentoring, where she's at and what she's looking for and how she's growing, it just kind of inspires me to think of like, well, how else could I be doing things, even though I'm supposed to be giving her advice. But so it's been a wonderful relationship and just it's, it's powerful. And one of the reasons for me, why it's so important is because when I was coming through in my broadcast career, I really did not have any mentors. And there just wasn't anyone at that time, especially Black women in Minnesota who were in sports broadcasting. And so um, I was able to make it through, but I felt like I really had to kind of go this very zigzaggy way through. And so now it's like really exciting for me to be able to help people get through and um, kind of get to where they're trying to get a little bit more directly. Yes. Well, I love where you're pointing us. Um, there's a couple of things that resonated was with your mentee. I think so often people look at those relationships as one way relationships, right? Mm -hmm. um, that the information is just flowing toward the mentee. But as the mentor, there's so much value that we receive, right, from being in those relationships, particularly from what it sounds like for you, um, because you feel like you have to give back, right? Like this is an opportunity for you to give back, particularly in the, the broadcasting field, because not just as a, a Black female journalist, but I think in the broadcasting field, it feels like it's a zero-sum game. It's either you or me. Like the more successful you are, you're going to take more opportunities from me. So I've heard in the past that people aren't happy to give help, right? But they're actually trying to block your, your opportunity. Yeah, that's real. That's a really, really good point. I hadn't even thought about that as far as why I may be wanting to do this right now, because 
I absolutely agree with you 100%. Broadcasting is a really super competitive field. It's a field that's predominantly younger people. And um, I had made a decision a long time ago that I would help and support anyone coming up under me, young women, in particular young women of color, um, and that I, I, I just couldn't live in the space of I can't help you because one day you might take my job mm -hmm. because one day a young person um, is going to take my job. And I hope it's a young sister who's fabulous and is, and, and hopefully I'm moving on to what I want to be doing, but I just didn't want to live in the space of I have to block and to, to protect my space. And so I'm good with my space. And I believe that if there's some reason why I'm not in that space anymore, that means I need to be in a different space. And so, um, so I'm glad that you had said that because I hadn't thought of like, that is a big part of why it's really important for me to do this work is, is this industry that I'm in. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's real. And shipping, like, right, unlocking that club, because I really think that, um, like, I've started to do a little bit. Um, last year, I had the great fortune of being invited to um, be an analyst with Pac-12 Women's Basketball. Have no idea what I'm doing. I'm going to be giving you a call, trying to get your advice as well. Um, but I reached out to a couple people, Rebecca Lobo and Doris Burke, um, who were fantastic and really gracious with their knowledge and their time and trying to help me out. And um, so two factors, like one, knowing that there were very few people that looked like me, like, right, to be able to reach out to. Uh, and two, I was apprehensive to reach out to ask for help because I've heard those stories of how people are a little bit hesitant to um, try to train the person that may eventually be taking their job. Like, what goes on in your mind when you are navigating these spaces? Because there aren't very many positions, right, in front right. of the camera. Um, and so as your, your career and your journey continues, like, wh how, who do you have to be? Well, one, I think that you you have to, first of all, just be good within yourself. And it's an industry that, you know, you mentioned, you know, two of the stars of the industry and Doris Burke and Rebecca Lobo, um, who I've had the um, great pleasure to work with both of them. And but what what I feel like is that you have to come to this career and you have to bring confidence and you have to be OK with yourself, because when you don't. And when you're always worried, like someone's coming up behind you, or I can't give her a tip because she's better or younger or cuter, or what all those other things that come in, then I think it takes away from the space that I'm in. And I think I can't really even be who I'm supposed to be if I'm like garden and protecting that way. And so, um, and that's not to say that like there aren't times where you maybe feel a little insecure in the space, but in general, you have to walk in the space really confidently. And so once I kind of got situated in my younger years with that, and that took some time, um, I think when I was first getting into broadcasting in my 20s, I was trying to be so professional and trying to like just force people to know that I know this game and I know how to be a broadcaster, that it really didn't allow me to have any personality. And people would always say, oh, you seem different than you do when you're broadcasting in real life. Because in real life, I would be laughing and joking and having fun and just kind of, you know, a little bit more of that. And it's one thing that I love about the broadcasters we're seeing right now, um, in particular, all the young sisters, is they're bringing their style, they're bringing their personality, they're bringing their looks, the hair's braided, the outfits are tight, you know, like those are things that like back in the day, no, you would just come in a suit and you don't want anyone to look at you for anything other than I'm just here to do this job. So, but when you see, when you see those young women coming with how they're supposed to show up, cause it's really who they are. It all of a sudden, it's like so enjoyable to watch them because it's, you know, you're seeing someone who's standing completely in their truth. And so that's, that's a really, really fabulous thing. That took me some years to get to as I was trying to feel comfortable in the in broadcasting as a young woman. Yeah, well, and I wonder if it's generational because I've noticed that same thing is, it is so powerful to see them showing up fully in their authentic personality. And, and I agree with you knowing some of them like outside of right broadcast, sure. it's authentic. It's who they are on a regular basis. and. 
And I know in my corporate career, there were times that I didn't feel like I could show up fully. Like, right, I was suppressing who I was to fit whatever the mold I thought they were expecting me to fit would be. Uh, and we actually had a guest on our show, Beverly Odin, a couple months ago, who was a journalist with Sports Illustrated for several years. And she talked about she was an Olympic volleyball player, right? Knew more than wow. most of her peers at the table. Um, but was hesitant to show up, right? Because they had more journalism experience. And mm -hmm. so she wasn't sure she could lean into knowing what her expertise was at that stage until she could prove herself. And I think having to prove ourselves is can be debilitating, right? Because you don't show up as yourself. You're compartmentalized exactly. who you are. Yeah, and that's real. I mean, it took me a while to shake that. And I just thought, you know, I had to you know, just very, be very corporate America. And, um, and it wasn't like I was acting like that. It's, it, that was all I had seen. Yes. So I didn't really even know that, you know, you could be a different way on air. So that's why representation matters so much, right? So now all these young women who are coming through in high school and younger are going to be watching ESPN and they're going to see, you know, Malika Andrews and um, her sister and all of the other fabulous women who are out there now. And they're going to be like, oh, okay, I look like that. I can do that. I sound like that. I dress like that. And yet I can still be professional at the highest level. Yeah. And so that key piece of, you know, seeing, believing, representation, all those things that we say all the time, it's just, it feels so good to actually see it up close now. Yeah, but like, but to take that back to the mentoring piece, broadcasting, you know, it is just inherently competitive. You know, that's just, there's very few positions that come open, you know. I mean, actually, I kind of feel guilty. I've been holding down the links analyst position for way yeah. too long. Like, and I've actually been thinking about that. Like eventually this needs to go to a WNBA player because that's like how the natural progression of things, right? When it's time for me to move. But like that, what in saying that, just to say that there are not a ton of positions. So, um, so when you come, you have to be ready and you have to be good and you have to be dedicated. Um, and once someone is willing to bring that then I'm always willing to help in any way I can. Yeah, well, and, and that is true. I, I've had that experience um, back in the day when I was working with the Lynx uh, as vice president of business operations and um, Fox Sports came to me inviting me to be uh, an analyst for the high school um, yeah. state championship. First, I had never had any broadcast experience. I wasn't sure about it. I remember having a conversation with you and you're like, you can totally do this. It's talking basketball, right? Just, just talk about what you know. And so I appreciate you in that moment. You probably don't even remember. Uh, you gave me confidence for a couple of reasons because you dispelled like the, the thought that I had to have this, this um, experience, a wealth of experience actually having been in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, but you also validated that we can be on screen, right? that to see a black woman thriving in that mm -hmm. role, doing such a great job. And we were lucky to have you with the Minnesota Lynx thank and they you. still are lucky to have you, um, I think is, is really important. So thank you for, for that in that moment um, of encouraging me to just enjoy it uh, and take advantage of the opportunity. But I also wanna to point to something that you just mentioned too, of, like in your kind of humility of being like, you know, maybe like right uh, there is, there needs to be somebody else that is gonna be following in my footsteps. and right now during a time where people are refusing to give up power right we see at the highest levels of congress like people want to hold on to power well yeah. past their expiration point um right. what is it about you and i because i think this shows up for black women that mm -hmm. we right want everyone to win not just ourselves and yeah. does that serve us well when does it serve us well and when doesn't it serve us well yeah, I probably thought a lot about that because you're right. I have thought about this role that I'm in and who's next to come through. And I really do strongly believe that the role belongs next to a WNBA player. And, and I see that because of the strength, the way that the WNBA has grown. And one of the reasons it's so strong right now is because we're seeing players come through finally and they're being head coaches. They're, not only were they you know, great players on the court, but now they're moving into spaces in the front offices of WNBA and NBA teams. They're um, moving into head coaching positions and assistant coaching positions in, on the men's side as well. And so these things, this is a progression that has to happen 
to take the women's game to the next level. And so I believe strongly in it that, uh, you know, that a WNBA player should move into the slot that I'm in. And, and I agree with you, like at sometimes as black women, it's like, we are trying to make it work for everybody. Like that is something that is inherent for me because I do think that is how it should be. And I think the only, the only thing I can think for myself is that when it's time for me to move on, I'll be ready to move on. And so, um, but I, I, I do inherently think that is the right thing. And I think that will happen. And, but yeah, you're right. I don't know why we do that all the time and not necessarily other people in, in different fields, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I think it is our instinct, right? We are caretakers at the core. Mm -hmm. uh, I think women in general are those who identify as female, um, right? In essence, are always trying to take care of everybody else, prioritizing others. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important for uh, women or those who identify as female to be in leadership roles. Because, right, we, we aren't trying to hold on to power selfishly. We're trying to make sure that if we win, others win. Um, one thing that I say all the time is empowered women empower others. Right? And we all are better off in those positions. So, again, I appreciate your perspective and your effort to make sure that people are in the right position in the roles at the right time. Uh, and I wonder how much of you having had to navigate a predominantly male-driven space um, and other spaces that you're navigating how much that influences who you are and how you show up. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've noticed is that in so many times in my career, I have been the only, you know, the only woman, the only black woman, the only six foot one woman. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so what, what happens with that when it doesn't change now, it's changed quite a bit in the field, in, in sports. And so I'm really excited about that. But for a while there, it was consistently not changing on my early end of my career. And what happens is you start thinking that's the norm is that like, well, there's one of us here and that's okay. And that, you know, and then what happens with that is then it's that same competitive thing that you were talking about before. Oh, they're going to hire another woman, another woman of color. Oh, wait, now there's two of us. That type of thinking and logic makes zero sense. It should be oh good, we're opening the doors, more people are coming in, more women, we're gonna have um, more understanding, bigger views, more conversations around things, right? But what? But it, it can happen in the opposite way. And that's a lot what I saw when I first was coming in, that if you like had one woman in place and one woman of color, then everyone kind of stopped there. And I think that created a kind of weird thing for women supporting women because you didn't really want to reach out to somebody else. And so again, like getting more people in. And so now that you see more people, more women in these spaces, it's like, great, open the floodgates. You know, there's more, now we get that it can be any position. And I, I was just having a conversation I thought was so interesting with someone because we were talking about how like the spaces where you still don't see women that much. And I was saying that I had to check myself because I was, I was on a flight and it was this, I was on this tiny little corporate plane. And when I got to the airport, the pilot came out and it was this tiny little blonde woman. She looked like she was 20 years old. And I was like, who are you? And she was like the pilot. And I was like, of oh, this plane? <laughs> And, yeah. and it really, it, it really stopped me in my tracks because I had seriously never seen a young female pilot before. And, and my thought process was really super backwards. It was like, oh my God, can she do this? And this, and those are the things that happen when you don't have access to spaces. You start questioning, well, could we, can we do those things? Yes. And, uh, and then of course we can. But when you don't see people doing it, you do have those questions. And so why that is so important. So now it's like anytime I, I see a female pilot, I'm like, yes, and this is so cool and I'm comfortable and I'm good. But like that, I was I was actually struck that I even had those thoughts. Yeah, well, and it's a really important point because all of us, right, to a certain extent may have this perspective. Um, and we think that there's a correlation between um, seeing someone in a position and knowing that that group 
or the group that they may be part of or the identity they may be in having the capability or the capacity to actually be in that role. And there's a disconnect there, right? And so yes. people prior to President Obama, right, mm -hmm. people may have thought, right, that, that Black people weren't capable right. of being political leaders. Um, right. But it wasn't yeah. because we weren't capable, it's because there's these systems and these structures that may prevent folks inside of different identities, whether it's gender, race, socioeconomic status, educational level, that prevent them from having those opportunities. Yeah, and you think about that in sports, like young kids coming through now will have no idea that for a while in football, we didn't know that black men could be quarterbacks. Yeah. And now you just see, you know, black quarterbacks everywhere and no one even blinks at it. And But you're absolutely right. It wasn't that black men weren't talented enough all those years ago to be quarterbacks because they weren't allowed that opportunity because people in their head really thought, could they really run the whole team and the quarterback's the most important position and how would they do that? And so that is real. That's real. And I think that's one of the things we all have to keep kind of center in front of mind of our minds is thinking like just because you don't see someone in that position doesn't mean they can't do it. It just means that we haven't got people in those spaces yet. Exactly. That's a, such a great example. I was literally watching um, Sports Center this morning, and it felt like almost every game that they were showing highlights from, there was at least one, and in many instances, two black quarterbacks that were starting quarterbacks um, that were playing in the NFL. Um, how the sea has changed. Uh, and I think that there's going to be a, di it'll be interesting to see the dynamic. Do we want that to continue? Like, where, 50, 60, 70, 80% of the league has a black quarterback, or will there be some systems and structures put in place to change that, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, and you mentioned something earlier, Leah, about having been the only one on a frequent occasion. And I think we say this quite a bit. I know I say it all the time. Um, many of us referencing, reference it in mixed company, but I don't know if we talk about what that actually means and how that feels. Can you dig in a little bit, maybe open up the curtains on like what it feels like to be the only one? Yeah, I, I certainly can because I know I know exactly what it feels like and I'm trying to think what is the best way to articulate that. I think one of the things that I notice and people ask me this, well, white people ask this often when, when in Minnesota because there's just not a lot of black people, like whenever I walk into a room, the first thing that I do, it's just... I do it without thinking is to see if there's any black people in the room or like if I go to someone's wedding I'm always like really quick just like do they know any black people and it's just and this is what happens when you are always just one of a few now if there was if, if I lived in a state that was majority black I wouldn't be doing that right so um so it's one of those things where you're aware you're just very aware all the time of of either your race or your sex or whatever it is that has you being the only one. And I think for me, because I was in sports and because I was kind of the, you know, jock girl growing up and all of that, I feel inherently comfortable sitting around guys talking about sports all the time. And so in those spaces, I rarely felt really super uncomfortable, you know, even in locker rooms, in the gyms, in the front offices where I would notice that it started to feel different was when more like in your job in corporate America and you're starting to see promotions and people moving and and then you're starting to recognize oh wait a minute now am I going to be looked at differently um, am I you know how do I how do I get in line for that promotion not really knowing how that works. And so that's that was a sense for me that like, okay, I, I need to be aware that even though I feel pretty comfortable sitting here, that the rules might be different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's, and I, to be honest with you, I've been really, really fortunate because even though I have been that only, I've also been supported by really good people who wanted to see me succeed. So, um, so I've had a balance of that. But I think the thing that just for me is just kind of you're always aware. You're always kind of um, wondering if anyone's thinking that she's the only woman in the room or, or you know, or just, um, you know, how comfortable do they feel with just being um, me being the only woman in the room? Um, so 
so yeah, so I, I just, I say that piece of, you know, just being really aware of it all the time. Yeah. No, I think about, as you were talking, you know, Serena and Venus Williams, right, as an yes. example, is people can see the outcome of their journey and the best of the best, right? We forget about Margaret Court and her 24 and, right? And we think of Serena at 23 championships. Um, I cannot imagine what that journey was. And we're using a lot of sports analogies, but I think this is very similar to what happens in the cor corporate space too, is we may conflate their success with the fact that you, you assume okay, if they were successful, if they're thriving, then it must not have been that hard. This sense of being the only one must not be that big a deal. But mm -hmm. I know personally, it is a big deal. And just because we can survive, right, those situations and have great success does not diminish um, how debilitating it can be to be in those spaces where you are the only one. And and you actually um, were a, a panelist for the launch of the Dignitas Agency's Accelerating Impact um, for Black People program in 2015. And um, that program was born out of us observing um, a, a white leader being the only person in a space full with Black and African-American students and where they were debilitated in less than 24 hours, they actually had a physical like right breakdown because they were the only one in the room. And wow. so as a result of that, we sat back and said, we often are the only ones that are walking in that room looking for someone else who looks like us all the time and they're not seeing it. How does that feel like every single day? It doesn't, it's, it's not that it isn't there. We just have found a way to yeah. ignore it or overcome it, but it doesn't diminish the debilitating factors that show up. Yeah. Um, and so would love to hear more from your perspective on like the real, real of what may be going on for you in those moments while you still are expecting yourself to thrive. Well, I think one of the things that I, you know, I think you had, a, I would always wish for is that as the guys go all off and to go golf together and everyone feels so good and comfortable is just like wondering what that would feel like for me to have that, you know, um, girl gang to head off with and do those things with and sit and have those conversations. And I think for the men that I don't even think they've even thought how lucky and great that is to have this built-in support system where we all think the same and do the same things and laugh and and our ins have our inside jokes and have this really strong comfort level with one another. And that in itself is just such an advantage of being in spaces where you just have this real comfort level. So I think for me, you know, you're absolutely right. I probably don't even know the impact because I've done it for so long. Yeah. And really, I mean, it's been the, my, the majority of my career and it probably will be the end of my career too, because really it's, it's, it's demographically where I live yeah. in the spaces that I'm in. And so, um, and so I've just been so used to that, but I do, I do feel, I think there's part of me that what I, what I do well in that space is that uh, I can work my way over and figure out a way to be comfortable with you if I, no matter what, I'm going to do that if I have to do that. And I've learned how to do that. And so um, that hustle of, of being that person in the room, I've just done that hustle for so long yeah. that it's it's hard for me, although I will say, um, like my, my son is going to school in Emory in Atlanta. And when I go to visit him and like I walk into these spaces and I'm like, ah, like there is just these you know, just kind of a sigh of relief when you walk in and yeah. <laughs> walk into a place and it's all black people. Yeah. And it's just, it's just different for me to have that because that has not been my life here. Yeah. No, it's true. And we, we normalize it. Like, right. Like you, you figure out a way similar to when you were getting ready to get in shape for a basketball season, right? Those first couple of workouts are painful, right? Um, and so when you're running two miles, it doesn't necessarily get easier, um, but as Kara Lawson says, you learn to do hard better, right? Um, yes. And so I think yep. for, for many of us, we've learned, we've normalized this, um, and it doesn't mean that it's not um, painful or 
again, debilitating or exhausting to have to do. We just mm -hmm. have been able to overcome it and come to expect that um, mm -hmm. from time over time. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think are better off for it to a certain extent, like, right? Um, and I think it magnifies the achievements. Like for you to have been at the pinnacle of the broadcast field for such a long time, mm -hmm. it speaks volumes about who you are, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, so much of it is, you, you know, you have to build relationships in this industry. We have to build relationships in every industry. You know, one of the things that I learned from um, Cheryl Reed, the Minnesota Lynx head coach, is when she was talking about coaching, she said that coaching is 95% relationship building and 5% strategy. And I always thought that was so interesting because I always thought it was all about the X's and O's and it's a chess match and who's going to outdo the person um, with those quick decisions on the court. And obviously that is a, a big part of winning, but what really makes her a great coach is her ability to tie into people through relationships and caring through people and connecting in. And I think that has been a gift that I have been given. And it's something that I like to do. And I pride myself on is that I like to get to know everybody and take the time to know everybody. When I walk into Target Center, like I need to know like the, the first security guard um, till, you know, the person sitting in the front offices. And that's just how I'm built. Um, and I think that is probably part of my longevity is just that there's a lot of connections there with a lot of different people. Yeah. Well, and, and I wonder how much of your journey impacts how you show up. You know, I read um, the statement on your website uh, and, it, and it gave me goosebumps, Leah. Um, you said growing up in poverty is in a racially blended family created social dilemmas for, for you at a young age. Uh, you learned that when your family doesn't fit the mold, you have to get comfortable breaking the mold. And it was one of your first wins in life. You know, yeah, there's so much nuance and vulnerability and power in that statement. Um, I had to read it multiple times because it just resonated with me for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah. What were the circumstances that were pivotal uh, in you unlocking that first win of getting comfortable breaking the mold? Well, I think it was having strong women in my life uh, since I was young. So my mother is a fabulous woman. She's 82 years old right now and still lives in our house that we grew up in in Powderhorn Park in South Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And she is uh, Irish, 99% Irish woman who has six kids and two of them are black and four of them are white. And her view of the world um, was always to protect these kids and to knowing that life was probably going to be more difficult for them being in this family that was blended by divorce and blended by race. She really kind of built and created a culture in our family. And part of that culture was how we would address each other. Like she didn't allow us to use terms like half brother or stepsister. And, and I would always, when I was younger, I would always say, mom, you know, like when I'm introducing my sister who's white and five, two, it's like, it would be easier if I could say half sister. So people understood. And she was like, no, because family, we don't have to qualify or explain family to anybody. Family is family. And she was very strong on that. And then she was very strong on us kind of being united as a group, kind of us, us kids against the world. And again, I think she was just knowing that we were probably going to need that support from each other. And, and real quickly, one of our first kind of, one of my first family memories of or understanding that the world was going to see us differently is when my family tried to go to a movie when I was about 11 or 12 years old and it was my parents and all six kids and we went to the movie theater and the manager at the theater would not sell us tickets to the movie because he had it was a rated r movie where you had deaf parents and my parents were there and he didn't believe that we were a family and he and he said to my mom you can't just bring any kids in here mm -hmm. and they didn't sell us movie tickets. And that was the first time like it was really, I was really aware that even though I knew we had a good family, that society wasn't going to see it that way. And my mom afterwards, like I was just like in tears and crying. And she was like, Leah, as soon as you can figure out and understand that it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks, 
and get good with yourself, then you're going to be fine. But if you're going to be worried every time someone questions this family, you know, she was just, she was just very hardcore about it. She was like, it's going to be a struggle for you. And so it was really at that moment, like 12 year old Leah was like starting to process like, okay, I got to walk through the world a different way. And I have to, you know, be accepting of these things, but be good with who I am and like kind of own my story. And so I started doing that work probably a lot younger than most people really started doing that work in my you know, 20s and 30s and stuff, I was really feeling pretty good and all of that kind of stuff because I was, I understood it. Like, well, I'm good. I have a good family. I'm doing the right things. If you don't like it on the outside, that's on you. So that was a really big part, but it was even to this day, you know, my I'm in a biracial relationship. Our kids are biracial, all of those things. Um, I'm, I see the looks and I see, you know, how people respond. I, in the end, I guess I just, it doesn't bother me because I really, I just don't care what other people think. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm, I will say that that's not an easy place to get to. And it takes many years of um, support from people and, you know, working on yourself and, and being in a space that you belong in. Um, I feel really fortunate because I, I work and live in areas that I really, really want to be in. And I know that is not everyone's reality. And so I think those places also allow me to kind of be able to walk, you know, freely through the world. Yeah. Well, can we unlock that a little bit? Because to get to, from where you were to where you are now, right, couldn't have been easy, right? It probably was similar to a roller coaster. Some days were much better than others. What did that feel like? What did that journey feel like? And what was the catalyst for you getting to the strength that you were demonstrating today? I would say, first and foremost, knowing that I was 100% loved and supported as a young person. And that was from, because I, I was the youngest of this Motley crew, these six kids. So I was very doted on as a young person. And really, I didn't have, like I did everything that my siblings did. And sports was my first thing in my life that I did that no one else in the family was doing. Um, before sports, I had no thought that was different than no original thought. I mean, really, I was just following my siblings because I was little sis and they were doing stuff. and I, So I would do it. And so the sports world for me kind of allowed me to grow as a person because not only did it give me confidence in walking in the six foot one body, but it was like, I loved the competition and I loved like feeling just like I, that I could connect with my teammates, but we could compete against each other. And I just had never felt that before. So sports just kind of unlocked this whole piece for me that I didn't know was there. And then it obviously brought me to my broadcast career. And so one of the reasons, again, like with the mentoring and stuff, I feel so grateful that I found that at a young age. But, but I was able to do all of that First and foremost, I think because I was just genuinely loved. And so I didn't have to do that work as a young person. I didn't have to like think about, am I worthy or do I belong and all those things? Cause that was really there. Um, I think for me, some of the, the things that maybe were harder um, was I didn't, I didn't always know who to, outside of my family, as I was working in corporate America and then in broadcast world, I really didn't know what questions to ask. And I didn't know that, you know, maybe I should, maybe I could feel a different way in the work world. And I just, there was some experiences that I just didn't have. And, and now in hindsight, I can really see that that kept me kind of locked down for a lot of years. And I think, again, it's like when, when you don't have access to people and, and you don't have um, women of color who are, you know, can help your women in general, um, there was sometimes where I just probably needed more of that surroundings. And then as I got older, I, I did find those people, um, the mentors, the people I could talk to, the people who understood. For, you know, many years when I was younger, you know, I kind of felt like it was just me. Yeah. And I appreciate 
your your family and your mother being able to give you that sense of value of being loved, right? That's a strong foundation for which to then do the things that you've been able to accomplish. And I also wonder, Leah, you know, um, had a conversation with someone here in Idaho several years ago um, is a, a white woman who had some uh, teenagers um, who were mixed and um, she had a car that was, you know, um, I think the lights were out or something like that um, and, and they hadn't had it replaced yet and um, needed to get something from the store really quickly to, to finish dinner. And so she asked her teenage son, who was black, to go to the store real quick um, it was after dark, go to the store, grab something so that she can finish dinner. And he was like, mom, I can't do it. And she was like, yeah, you can. Like, here's the keys. You know how to drive. Like, right. Like I need you to do this. And he's like, mom, I can't. And, and she kept like not understanding like what was preventing him from wanting to, to get out there. And he finally was like, mom, like there is a, a light out on this car and I'm afraid I'm going to get pulled over by the cops. And you know what happens when that shows up. So I wonder, like, right, like you were loved. And how did you share with your mom of understanding what, what journey you were on as a, as a Black woman? Well, that's so interesting because so my mom was the exact opposite. And I think because she grew up poor in Irish community where she felt like people just, she didn't feel respected. She felt like people, um, men, and women disregarded her because she was poor and white and came from a certain part of town. Um, different issues, but sure issues that impact you. So for us kids, like, so my brother Daniel, who's black, like she, she was always saying to him, you cannot be out. And Dan did get pulled over a whole bunch of times. And it was my mom who would then this was back in the day. So he, the cops, like back in the day, if you got pulled over by a cop, you could call and make a complaint and they would actually come to your house and talk to you about it. And my mom would be out there talking to the police, you know, saying you can't, you can't do this. And, but she was very aware of those issues. I mean, my mom marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. So, yeah. so she, those things were there for us. She was very aware that, um, we had an issue once where someone came to our house at like two in the morning and they, and something had, it was a woman, a white woman, and my brother wanted to help. And my mom was like, no, 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 no. You can't help. Let me help. And we'll, you know, if we're calling the police, I don't want any mistakes happening here. So, so luckily my, and I think that's one of the reasons for me that, you know, being biracial, I didn't have, I will say this, I didn't have what was kind of the typical common issues for kids who are biracial, where you're kind of, you're stuck in, in one side or the other, or you don't really feel comfortable. Because I didn't, with the way we were raised, it was very blended. Our neighborhood was blended white and black. Um, my mom was very, very aware of black issues and what we needed to be aware of. And so I just, I've always felt a comfort level in those spaces. Um, and and I've, I know a lot of kids that are mixed and biracial, a lot of people. And usually there is some, you know, major issues there because like, you know, your black side doesn't accept you or the white side is weird. Um, of all the stuff that I may have in life, that has not <laughs> been <laughs> You're like, thankful for that, right? right. Yeah. Exactly. No, I think and that's a big one, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and it's wonderful that you right, you can acknowledge and recognize that. And, and kudos to your mom and the surroundings of what you grew up in. Because mm -hmm. I think so often, right, having lived experiences that, right, it may be inside of different identities, but where some of the, the obstacles that may get in the way are similar helps you to make those connections. And I think that's really important. And I think, you know, to be honest with you, like I, you know, as a, a black woman, I grew up in, in Mountain Home, Idaho, right? And so um, the things that I struggled with was um, I spoke like I was white, right? Mm -hmm. According to family and, and folks, uh, right, from different places. So I didn't sound like I was black, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very black, right? So not being able to feel like I fit into any situation, um, yeah, which great. was well into, you know, my 20s, um, had an impact on, on just me being confident in who I was and feeling like I could be authentic because I didn't know where I fit. 
It was very yeah. comfortable in white spaces because that's what I grew up with. And many of my friends, the majority of my friends were white, right? Um, right. Well, I always think when I think about you, of course, I always think immediately of Stanford mm -hmm. and just and to me, like just because it's such a powerful image of like what Stanford means to this country. And so like it, it immediately has me thinking so many things about you that I've never even asked you, um, but like, you know, like. I can't even imagine what that was like to go to school with those kids. But like you just have always come across as like, you are like this, always like the smartest woman in the room, smartest person in the room. And, but like, but because that's such a different experience than the majority of people of color have had, it almost immediately has everyone thinking like, oh my God, what is she like? Because, and just like, so those labels sometimes too can kind of set you into a different space. Exactly, exactly. Like what your lived experiences can be very, very different and comfortable in some spaces. But what, what I even recognized in going to Stanford was like, right? Like it was, I went from being kind of in this little fishbowl of mountain home uh, mm -hmm. into a completely different stratosphere and where did I fit? Where do I belong? Like, who was I drawn to? Like, I got curious about people that looked like me because I didn't have the, the benefit of being around them on a regular basis unless they were family members, right, from my family in Texas. Um, and so that wasn't a daily interaction that I had. And so how did I fit in and where did I connect there? Uh, and then, right, certainly for the white students, it's a predominantly white school. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was able to be comfortable with people that were similar to those folks that I had grown up with, but it was a completely different space because I knew that they were, did she deserve to be here? Of what was showing up in the back of my mind as well. And all of those things can prevent us from just showing up fully. Absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is just that so many times, and I wondered this because I've had people say this to me when I have received, when I've applied for jobs and have gotten them, I've had people say, oh, yeah. Um, that's right. They needed a, a the diversity hire, or oh yeah, oh yeah. I knew. I figured they probably need a black woman. And and I think what you don't realize is how like that gets so stuck into like dark spaces and like in your foundation that you just realize. Like I was just thinking about this the other day when someone said the diversity hire, and I was like, okay, let's not call him the diversity hire. Let's just say he got the job. Yeah. And and that like is some deep stuff that can stay with you and it's starting to wonder like, did I, did I ever like just get a job because I was like the best candidate for the job? And to be honest with you, I believe the answer is yes, but let's just say it was, let's just say no, let's just say I was actually hired every time for a diversity issue. I was like, well, then I stayed in the job for 20 some years. So I'm guessing that it must, you know, I must've done a good job. Yeah. But the thought that you even have to have that thought process is is part of the things that can kind of chip away at feeling that kind of confidence yeah. that you need to kind of navigate. Like if you do want the promotion or you want to move to that next level, you know, sometimes that's hard if you're thinking, well, sh can I do that? Do I belong? You know what I mean? Yeah. So those little things can chip away at you. Yes. No, I think it's such an important point. Like um, Stacy, my business partner with the Dignitas Agency and I were in conversation a couple of years ago with someone who was in Hollywood and they were talking about right the lack of um, representation, not just uh, in front of the camera, but in, in a bunch of positions. Right. And um, a colleague of ours was telling us stories of like they, they had these efforts by some of these these organizations to try to bring in more diverse talent, but the messaging matters, right? Words really matter. And so what they ended up doing is having some sort of um, internship or externships, and they would have everyone at the table and point out that's our diversity intern, right? And so two things happen. First, the, that individual they were diminished, right? And drawn attention to that, did you deserve a seat at this table? Did you earn a seat at the table? Um, and secondly, the people that are now looking are discounting who that is because they're like, is this person even qualified? And to your point, what is both are true is, right, like in order to remediate what is happening where, right, there are less than a, a decent percentage of black people, women in certain roles, like we're gonna have to hire, right? 
people in, in those identities. But it doesn't mean that they're not capable or qualified. They just haven't had the opportunity. And in some cases, maybe they don't have the same experience because the system has prevented them from having experience. But I can guarantee you, like for yourself, for you to be able to be at the table, you had to work twice as hard to get there because they weren't going to make a hire and, and keep somebody on board for 20 plus years who was not capable of holding their own weight. But it's it's a it's a brain thing, like right? It, it makes you question your your capabilities. Yes, and I've I've had that conversation with my kids that I don't want them you know, thinking that as they navigate through their college years and then grad school and all those things that like, be aware that those things can kind of seep into your confidence. And, and we talk about confidence a lot in this house because we're all sports fanatics. And I love kind of watching that dynamic of, of like when an athlete sometimes can just beat you by their confidence, like just walking out on the court. I think Serena does this a lot. We're just like, when her presence and the way she walks on the court has the other player like thinking, oh, I'm going to get beat, you know, like, but like it's such a cool, that has to be real. And like, I don't know, this, that's just something I think is super interesting. But so, so for my own kids, I want them to have confidence when they walk into these workspaces. And, and the only thing I can really say to them is that, you know, I, it's probably the same old stuff my mom said and and we keep saying you know be good be prepared and then just come in and now I feel like I think back in the day we had to say more like you had to be better and you had to you know always be on your a game and I don't say that so much anymore I, I feel like it's now like you do need to be prepared and you have to work hard but then you have to bring your like your true self yeah. to it yes bring you think that changed a little bit yeah it has it has bringing your true self and one of the things that's um, you know, Tara Vanderveer used to say all the time is um, mental is the physical as four is to one, like, right? And I think so often we think about our actions or activity and not our mindsets. And, and yeah. one of the things I agree that ath athletics and, and participation in sports taught me was um, it's all about the mindset of, of thinking I can versus I can't, right? Even in those moments where you've never done something before, to be able to know, like, there's been things that I hadn't done before and I figured them out and I will figure this out too. Mm -hmm. But I think, Leah, like many of us are action oriented, but mindset's really important. And so I heard this statement once uh, and I can't remember what the context was, but I mm -hmm. say it all the time. My friends laugh about it, um, but it has become the essence of my mindset. And that statement is that losers worry about winners and winners worry about winning. And winning isn't just about the outcome, right? It's the mindset, the mentality, the journey, what you're learning, um, where your fears are, where you make mistakes and you recover from those mistakes, um, being able to overcome loss, all of those different things. So curious that when you started Rethink the Win, mm -hmm. what is your definition for winning? is that there's more to winning than just the win, that it's the process, it's the everyday. When when you talk to teams that have won championships like the Minnesota Lynx, you understand that the big goal is to win a championship, but the real wins come each and every day in this long road of this process of winning each day. And part of those wins are um, relationships that have been built during this process of, um, you know, finding small little things that you can be good at as a role player, including everybody in, um, making people feel seen and heard. Like there are all these things that have to happen to create championship teams that have nothing to do with the winner, the loss at the end of the night. And, and to me, like that was really huge for youth sports. I think it's really incredibly important. And that's how the reason I started Rethink the Win was because I had not participated in youth sports as a kid because I just had a very different childhood experience. And I just, I never played. I just played at high school, in school. I didn't go to like camps and all of that. So when I had kids and they started doing all of the volleyball camps and baseball and basketball, and I was sending them and then they started doing AAU and traveling and all that, I was shocked by the environments that we were asking these kids to play in. And oftentimes they were very hostile and negative. And oftentimes it was so normalized that adults would be yelling at young kids, sometimes parents at their own kids or um, adults yelling at 13 year old volleyball line judges. 
and it was so normalized no one was even saying anything and and so what i found that was really dangerous about that is like we want kids to participate in sports because there's a million reasons why you can come out better having done that not because they're going to be a wnba champion or the best player in the world if that happens more power to you but we understand that's a very very small group of people and so i was wondering why we were acting like all of these kids were going to be these elite athletes and and so it's so i think it's a complicated the reason the world has kind of shifted in that way i think basically is because we live in a super competitive society and everyone has decided that sports is one of the ways that you can succeed and get to college and college is incredibly expensive and Unfortunately, it's an incredibly difficult way to try and get a kid through college is through a, um, you know, division one athletics. But, but so for me, but where we think the win isn't just about youth sports, it's, it's in across the board is when you focus just on winning, winning at all costs, things usually go to the left. And, and we see that in our workforce. We see that in corporate America. We see that when, um, when you have people that when you have a workforce that doesn't have enough pay, that doesn't have health insurance, those wins have gone away. And then you have these hollow workspaces where people can't even really make a living. And so there's just all these different ways to look at what is winning. So for me, rethinking winning is really across the board in all areas that we need to think about, you know, what's the big picture here for the health of our kids for the health of our society and for the health of all of us mm. well we need more of that and i appreciate you taking on this challenge um because you're exactly right it's it's, it's pervaded not just you sports but it's society as a whole and if we can change our mindset to think about things differently right um i think the experience for each of us as individuals and certainly collectively will change and it doesn't mean that anybody will be less off I think we all will flourish in those situations. Yeah. And I and I hope we think the win is um, dialed up for all parents of youth, young athletes, because it's really the parents that are the yeah. catalyst for modeling what that actually should, should embody. It is. And I think, you know, one thing I understand for parents is that in general, if I think the majority of parents really just want what's best for their kids. But I think sometimes bec um, because we like love them so much, we're willing to do just anything for that and then that's where things start going okay that was too much and um i don't think you needed to call the coach out in front of everybody because your kid didn't play last night you know like things start going to the left when we start treating people that way and so usually it's just like if you can like step back from it and dial things back but it's difficult like raising kids right now it's not an easy time to, to raise kids with social media and phones and sports and it's a really competitive world and one of the things that we're seeing at this generation is there's more anxiety and depression than any other group that's come through so to me the most important part really needs to be protecting those young people and protecting their mental health and so um that's one thing i say to parents when you put them in sports is like don't don't assume that this is just going to be a great experience you need to surround them and create a great experience through adults that are acting appropriately and and creating environments that will allow them to have experiences that are positive yeah and, and thanks for bringing up mental health uh I think that when this this episode drops, um, we'll we'll be about a week out from um, Mental Health Awareness Day or something like that. I can't remember the exact name of it, and um, it's really important. What I appreciate is that we are having more athletes starting to step up and talk about it and and unlock how important it is for us to have these conversations and to normalize it. Because you're right, I think that there's so much pressure being put on kids at a younger age to specialize in one sport, to get a scholarship, to be great at something that they may not even care about, right? Um, and it's putting a lot of pressure. And we've noticed over the last couple of years um, inside of COVID, which is creating a mental health crisis for people around the globe in general, there's been a lot of student athletes at the collegiate level that have taken their lives. Yeah, it's been awful. It's, it's amazing. And those were high achieving athletes at you know at big time schools and it's it's very disturbing it's it the pressure 
that is in, and what's interesting, uh, so the pressure that's on young kids to succeed right now. And, and one of the things I think is that we act like there's only one path and that's there's one way to do it. And there's obviously many, many, many paths, but I think we have to be so careful with young people that are, especially with our high achievers, because they can, they can do a lot. They can do like, I know my kids did way more in their high school years than I did in my high school years, as far as balancing academics and athletics and all of their, you know, everything that they did on the side to build their resumes, although they did way more. So the fact that they can do that, good. Um, is it healthy for them to have done that? Does it put them in a better space 10 years down the line? We don't know yet. Um, but I think you have to be really careful with it because sometimes it's just kids doing this, not even realizing like none of this is making me happy. I'm just, I'm just doing. So yeah, it's, it's, I do feel for the young ones. I know everyone's like this next generation and millennials and all that, but I have a, I have a lot of empathy for them because I think they're coming through it in a difficult time. Yeah. You know, I was reading a book um, by Patrick Mentioni, um, one of his new books, it's um, the six types of, um, working genius. And a couple of the examples that he, he uses or talks about in his podcast, it's a great podcast as well, Working Genius. That's and um, he talks about like even for, for athletes, and this is true inside of any organization, is sometimes people are put in positions that they're really good at. And you think that because they're really good at and they may be thriving in that role that they're happy. And that yeah. isn't always the case. Right. Um, I used this example earlier in, in talking about the book, um, chefs, people that love to cook and started a restaurant, they get further and further from doing the thing that they love, which is yeah. cooking, to run a restaurant. And, and many of them are miserable, right? The mental health that comes up. Athletes, there's a lot of athletes that don't like playing sports, but they're yeah. six, five and talented and people expect them to play sports. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly right. And so that's where I challenge people to rethink winning and what it means. And the one thing I will say just to make clear to everyone is I like to win just as much as the next person. So I'm not the person who's saying, let's give everybody a trophy. I'm saying that we can, I, well, one, I've never met an athlete who doesn't want to win. We all want to win and we all need more wins, but it's how we get there and what we're willing to do to get there, to get our wins um, that can become, you know, really, dangerous at some times. And, and so that's why I challenge people to rethink it. Yes. Well, and at different stages in your journey, you have to rethink the win. Um, one of the things that I think is really remarkable, Leah, in your journey is that you didn't start playing basketball until what, your junior year in high school and then went on to earn a scholarship to the University of Minnesota and right now have this career that has taken off because of right? Yeah. Um, your connection to sports. Um, and so I think oftentimes people think, well, it's too late for me to start or it's mm -hmm. too late for me to be good at something. But your journey is quite different. What have you learned about yourself like in quickly being able to pick something up and it being part of your life's work? Yeah, well, one, I was thankful that I had a coach that was willing to do that work with me because when I tried out for the high school team at South High, he was like, where have you played before? And I said, well, you know, in the backyard with my brothers and in gym class. And I was really proud of these spaces. And he was like, he was looking at me like, oh, my God. And so, but then when he saw that I had like all this raw talent and he was like, okay, I can teach you the game if you're willing to learn it just you have to be an open book talk about mindset he's like i need you just to have this really positive open mindset so we can just teach you quickly and that's exactly what we did and i just was like a sponge and he like but i was learning the game as i was playing so i was sometimes would be looking at high school i'd be looking at him and he would be like okay get out of the lane you know like okay arm up and do this and and but it it completely changed my life because it opened me up to understanding that like one, I could learn, like, as you said, quickly, there was so much I didn't know. And outside of sports, it made me also understand that like, wow, there's a whole big world out there of lots of things I don't know. So be open to learning more. And, um, and sports really brought me to that space. And then as I got better and better, at basketball, just getting that confidence that I needed, like we talked about, to be able to walk into some of these spaces. 
and that was just critical for everything that I was doing. So I'm incredibly grateful to the game because it has, yeah, it's just, it's changed my life. Uh, I really can't imagine what it would look like without it, but it's, it's taught me basically everything in my adult life has somehow kind of worked its way through sports. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing that because I think it's really important for all of our listeners who may be contemplating something that's outside the box, maybe completely different than the career that they're in, um, maybe completely different than where they know that they're really good. And for me, this past year was gardening, right? I had never started a garden and I love it, but I was open to learning more and listening and asking for help. And I know that that same thing is true for women that are thinking about starting businesses, they have a passion project or a side hustle, but they're not quite sure what it takes to, you know, build a platform such as Rethink the Win. It's be open to, right, the learning and asking for help and growing along the way. Yeah, that has been, and it's, plus it's, it's what makes life interesting. It's been really fun. Like for me, it's kind of like, you know, the next step for me is kind of taking like in the speaking world and it is, is really kind of taking these stories and what I've learned and going out and sharing that with the world and it's more of a speaking platform. And one of the things I've really enjoyed about that is that um, when you do TV, you you get to present and bring things to the audience, but you don't get that connection with the audience where when you speak in front of people, you really get that eye contact and people nodding and then people coming up to you afterwards. And so kind of to me, that's like the next iteration of the career is just kind of um, all these different things coming together in the speaking world. Nice, nice. Well, one more thing before we head to the back nine that I also want to unlock a little bit to see uh, where you are leaning in and learning is um, being on an advisory board for a, a corporate board. Like, what has that experience been like, and what are you trying to unlock there? That's this is a, a perfect conversation for this podcast because I didn't even know that that was a possibility for me to sit on a corporate board. It's nothing I've ever dreamed of. It's not something that I strive to do because I didn't think it was accessible. And so I never looked down that road. I didn't talk to people about it. And because of my work in sports and and just the people that I was dealing with, um, Bell Bank, whose board that I sit on, they happen to be a sponsor of um, the Loons, our soccer team, Minnesota United. And crossing paths with people there, I met some of the people who work at Bell Bank, and we started having conversations that kind of lasted for about a year. And initially, it kind of started of like, hey, maybe you could come speak at some of our employee events. And then... Um, and then they have something called a Bell Bank Champion. We kind of talked about that. And then eventually, one of the guys that I was talking to, one of the executives said, you know, what we would really, really like is for you to sit on our board. And I was super surprised and shocked. And so then I needed them to explain to me why, why I could sit on a bank board and how I could really help this bank board because everyone else sitting on that bank board is a banker. And, um, and, and they explained specifically what they were looking for from me, which was that I have been embedded in this community for my whole life. And they are looking to build out in this community and needed me to kind of help lead them through where, what spaces we needed to be in, um, how we can help rebuild Minneapolis, what's and and when I saw that, that was a space that I could help in. And that's really what they were looking for. It became this really great fit. And um, it's just been my year anniversary. And it's been an amazing experience. But you're right in that, like, I never would have thought I could have done it. Um, it was like a brand new thing that's opened doors for me. And again, now I'm having that same sense of like, now I have to like, try to open the doors for others. Um, because I, I'm sure if I was feeling that way, there's plenty of other young sisters who were thinking like, what are you talking about serving on a corporate board, you know? Absolutely. And, and now is the time, right? Now mm -hmm. these companies that are truly committed to um, yes. equity and inclusion um, are taking a look at their board seats and saying, we need more diversity on our board seats. And so they're going to be looking for black women, and, right? They, 
check two boxes at once, like right, race and gender, right. right? And so let's take advantage of it. There's a couple of things that you mentioned that I that I want to point out. You said, well, you know, the board is consisting of a bunch of bankers. Exactly, right? Group think, right? Yeah. They all have that same perspective, so they need a new perspective. Right. Right. Yeah. And and that that was that was such a just a new thought for me because I'm thinking, well, they want all bankers because it's a bank. And it's like, no, we, we all have the same thought. We're trying to get a different thought on the board. And this is why we know that that companies that have women um, as top executives are sitting on their boards or women of color do better than other corporations because it's different views of the world. Um, we, you know, women spend most of the money. We run most of the houses. We do all these things. So to not have that thought process coming into your board meetings is not a great decision for your company. Yeah. But, um, but it's been something that's just, you know, newly happening in, in across the country. And um, there has been a lot of initiatives that are trying to bring in more women, but it's been, it's been eye opening for me and incredibly positive experience that I'm really pleased about. That's great. Well, congratulations to you on that. And you, you've talked a little bit about this today, but I think a common theme that we have in Unlocking the Club is relationships matter. So nice. your relationships, right, with the wound, with the work that you're doing locally, with the community, um, right, the reputation that you've built, the trust that you've built in the Minneapolis-St. Paul community, right, was the bridge like, right, that gave you this opportunity and you've earned it and you're kicking down doors and knowing you, right, going to be opening doors for others. Um, and, and I want to point to and see if you have the same feeling. Like recently I was um, invited to a board a few years ago and invited to be the chair of a board for um, a health system here in, in Idaho. And I was happy to be on the board. Healthcare is not in my background, learning a lot in the process. Yeah. And when they invited me to, to chair the board, I had to pause and I was like, I I don't know, give me a couple of years to prepare, to shadow someone. And I talked to, I have a friend's group um, who um, kind of, we have a council where we can throw ideas or things to, to say, you know, should I or shouldn't I? And they're like, why wouldn't you? And so then I went to a conversation to um, the, the president and the, the previous board chair and was like, well, I'm hesitant for these different reasons. And they're like, Angela, we're bringing you on the board because we have no one else that does this, that brings this, or that to the table. You are really good at these things and we need that at a high level. And then I finally was like, of course, right? I should take this position, but I questioned my capability because I didn't see anybody and haven't seen anybody that looks like me on those boards and wasn't sure what value I would bring. Really important for you, you're being invited to the table because you you have something to offer. And when you get to the table, you're, it's your responsibility to challenge them and hold them accountable for those things yes. as well. Yep. That's real. And that's that's absolutely right. But I feel that story, Angela, I bet every woman, every woman of color can tell that same exact story because I have done that probably in every space that I've been in. Like I'll, I'll be in one position and then someone will say, well, let's have you do this. And I'll say, well, well are you sure? And and it's 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 a difference between men and women. And that men will jump in that job and they'll give a resume be way before that they're ready for it. But we as women like to be 100 percent qualified and ready for that position. And that's really not how it, it works, because so much of what you learn, you learn on the job while you're doing it. You know that you bring the qualifications so that it, but that is so real. And I think it blocks so many of us. And one of the I mean, just having conversations with young women, like one of the things, one of the quotes that I've been using from Brene Brown is, you know, don't walk through the world looking for evidence that you don't belong because you will always find it. And I think that's what we're sometimes when we just block ourselves is we're like, well, no, I'm not. I don't I don't think I belong in that room and I'm sure they wouldn't want me there or I'm not quite qualified. But when I in five years from now, I might be ready and. We just got to stop blocking ourselves. We have to stop blocking ourselves and rethink the win, right? Yes, and, exactly. And I think, you know, um, in the last uh, show, I talked a little bit about um, humility, right? How sometimes I find it difficult to accept um, gratitude or appreciation um, because I feel like I want to put on this air of being humble. And um, I was reminded of, and I think actually it was uh, in the podcast with um, Patrick Lencioni um, about C.S. Lewis's quote um, 
uh, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And so like it's our responsibility to own our power, right? To own our power, show up confidently and competently in those spaces. And when you are offered an opportunity, right? There's work to be done, but when you're offered an opportunity, ask yourself, why not? Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah, those things, those are lifelong pieces to work on, you know, when people, you know, I think, I feel like, you know, maybe at this part of my career, because I'm on the other end now, it's like people are thinking all these things are in place. And I just feel like you're always learning and you're always taking in these things. And I mean, it, this was probably five years ago, but way into my career where I was like talking at some event. And I mean, this was like a basic compliment someone had given me. And the first, and it was like, I was on a stage and someone had given me this compliment. And because I just didn't really feel comfortable ha like having that compliment just sitting on me, I kind of just downplayed it. And I was like, well, and I kind of did these things to like dismiss the compliment. And so afterwards, this older black woman came over to me and she kind of just pulled me aside and she said, next time someone gives you a compliment, just accept it. And that was really powerful for me because I realized that like, I just had to like somehow, you know, take, take a little bit of it away. And, um, and I think, I think those things are lifelong things that we deal with. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I, I do, I think it's black women. I think it's women specifically, we want to feel like we're team players. And so mm -hmm. noticing that, and I appreciate that woman for coming up to you and saying yeah. that it was so powerful for her to take the time to do it. And me, what I said in the last episode, I got together recently with some friends from high school and we talked about this. And so our saying, what we encourage each other to say when somebody gave each other a compliment was, thank you. It's true. Like, right, <laughs> of even like going over the top. Like, right, yeah. uh, you're great, thank you, it's true. And owning that and receiving That's it good. in a way that it was meant for you to receive. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, learning to receive it. That's yeah. important. Awesome. That's good, I like that. Awesome. Well, we are rethinking how to win here with Leah B. Olson on Unlocking the Club. And we'll be right back with more in this conversation on the back nine. Do you want to stop feeling like you have little to no control over your life's journey and instead amplify your life's purpose? You all know me as Angela Taylor, host of the Unlocking the Club podcast, but I am also a business, career, life, and leadership coach helping my clients to live their best life. Every day, I help my clients discover what they truly want in life and then unlock the club on how they can live their best life. If you're like many of my clients, you have found yourself over the years prioritizing everyone else and everything else, your job, your significant other, your family, your friends, your community, the list goes on and on. Well, I'm here to tell you the best thing you can do for others is to invest in yourself. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to succumb to the fear of failure. You don't have to be perfect. You don't need to feel like you're being selfish. You simply need to prioritize you. You may be thinking that coaching is for other people, but trust me when I say that we all could benefit from a good coaching relationship. Together, we'll build a plan to help you amplify your gifts, clarify your goals, and accelerate your journey toward the life you desire, which may be finding financial wealth, spiritual health, relationship success, and or freedom and flexibility. You no longer have to feel like you aren't welcome into someone else's club. Let me empower you to leverage all of your extraordinary gifts and create your own club. Head on over to unlockingtheclub.com to book a free 20 minute introductory call to learn more about our Unlocking Your Journey coaching packages or use code UNLOCK to get a 15% discount on the six month coaching package. Today is the day to invest in yourself. Let's unlock your journey. All right, 
Welcome back to Unlocking the Club. I'm your host, Angela Taylor, and uh, we are here with our special guest today, Leah B. Olson, talking about winning and learning and the life's journey, um, particularly the one that we both have enjoyed through sports. Um, and here on the back nine, Leah, we just kind of find out, want to find out a little bit more about you. So I um, want to start off by just asking you, besides your own home, um, what is the place that you feel safest to be yourself? Let's see here, probably in um, basketball arena. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love being on a court around the game, watching people like there's just something about that, that um, watching great athletes, watching the interactions that you have to have on the court, watching how beautiful the game is, like all those places, like that's like a safe, happy space for me. Yeah, I would agree. I watched the recent episode of The Shop with um, LeBron and Lisa Leslie was one of the guests. Um, I saw that. And I, yeah, and I, I appreciated how you can tell that how they each have evolved, but how they were able to claim how important, right, being in those spaces and being able to play this sport that they love has been to their life. Yeah, that was beautiful. I thought the same thing. Is is it's it's a privilege, and I think we all know any at whatever level that you're able to play the game at and i say this to people who have played in high school and they're out and want to dismiss it well i only played in high school and it's like um the high school experience is a powerful experience as well and comes at a really critical and important time in your life when you're trying to figure stuff out so having teammates or being part of something is really key so Whatever level you're at, um, I just think sports has the ability, doesn't always deliver, but has that ability to give you that um, special space that makes you feel really comfortable. Yes, being in the arena, special. Um, well, Leah, what's a situation that you walk into with trepidation every time? Probably anything that has anything to do with math, and numbers like this is my <laughs> this is my weakness and like anytime we have like tax season comes around and we have to go in like the accountant's <laughs> office i feel like so clueless luckily i have a husband who doesn't feel as clueless because i could just the guy could be saying anything to me and i'd be like great right, <laughs> should i sign here um so yeah any any space but there's a lot of numbers happening. That's a problem. All right. All right. So no analytics, right, in, in the broadcast booth. Yeah, you know, that's so funny because, yeah, as you know, analytics are just becoming such a bigger piece of the game, which I think is super interesting. But what I have to do with that is sometimes I need to sit down with someone who has an analytical brain and I'll be like, explain why this matters to me, like on some of the pieces, because some of them I'm like, I don't get it. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, and, and as we've witnessed in today's conversation, you um, are an open book and we appreciate you sharing so much about your journey. What's something about yourself that you refuse to hide? Ooh, I refuse to hide. Um, probably just, um, you know, who I am as a person, my family and my background. If it's if you don't like it, that's okay. If you love it, that's okay, too. But um, I'm not going to hide it or change it for anybody. Love it. Love it. Well, and what's your superpower? You know, like that characteristic or trait or attribute that you think um, allows you to have the impact that you would like to have? Um, that I have, I think I have a high level of empathy and connectedness to people. I feel like I can feel people's energy. And so I want, I like to try to lift people's energy in that way. So that's one of the reasons why I think I like being in rooms where I can connect in with people because yeah. there's yeah something that just feels really right with me on that. No, connecting this definitely is your superpower. And I think it's your superpower because it doesn't just show up when you're in person with Leah, but it comes across over the airwaves as well, how connected you are to the work, to the people, to, you know, um, your colleague on the, on the um, broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely is your superpower. Thank you. That's awesome. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, when you think about the world that we live in and the spaces that you navigate, what's the story that still needs to be told? Let's see here. So um, the world that we live in and the spaces that we navigate, what's the story that still needs to be told? 
What are some examples of how other people have answered this question? <laughs> well, I think, you know, that has been like what we want to unlock, and you've shared some today already, is, is just, you know, about the, the true journey that people are going through, right? Yeah. That's, that, you know, it's not a myth, some of these things, um, and we need to tell it more so people start to acknowledge and recognize and appreciate people. Yeah. One of the things I think is, is that like maybe just what you're saying is there's, if, if we can get people from all kinds of classes, all different types of neighborhoods, black kids, white kids, if we can get everybody to like own their stories, but then be open to hearing other people's stories, it would, I think it would just help ease some of the pressure that we're feeling in this country right now where, um, it feels like so um, combative at every moment. And some of the issues that we're having are all the same issues, but we're just calling them different things. Um, and to me, um, you know, I think that most important piece is that everybody wants to be seen, valued, and heard. Yeah. And um, if we can find ways to do that more, I think that will help with some of these issues. I think that's such an important story to be told. And because we're on a show, we're talking a lot about sports. When you said that, it reminded me of the, the Jordan versus LeBron argument. And I think we're gonna spend so much time debating who's better and not appreciate both of them for being amazing. It's funny you bring that up because one of the things I say in one of my speeches is that like the reason I love sports is because I actually love the background stories of sports, of all how people got there and who is LeBron James and his family and then Michael Jordan and and that. But what doesn't really interest me that much is the stats on who's better than who, because I think that argument is never going to end. And it doesn't, I think they're both like amazing. And so I, I don't even need to do that. I don't need to compare them, but I get there's a big segment of the world that loves doing that every single day. Um, I prefer to know the stories of the people who are um, that. Yeah. The story behind the athlete. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of spaces where it doesn't have to be who's better, best or best. Right. Like mm -hmm. it's like all of the stories really matter and appreciate you sharing that perspective as, as a story that we need to unlock. When are you, when you're at your best, um, however you define best, um, what is true for you? I'm feeling good. My hair is done. <laughs> and <laughs> amen to that. I know what you mean. <laughs> you know, some days I could, everything else can be broke, but if my hair is good, we're good. Um, and um, in, in those moments, sometimes like when I'm just like with my people and I'm feeling like healthy and good, I just can be like so grateful. Of, like I can be exactly in the moment, just grateful for that exact moment. Um, yeah, that's, that's a happy place for me. Yeah, I think it's so important for you to know what makes you feel good and powerful, mm -hmm. right? And making sure that you implement that in your day so that you can feel powerful. That's awesome. Well, you're doing some amazing things, Leah. Um, any special projects you'd like to share with our listeners and where can we find you? Well, let's see, right now I'm working, I'm kind of in between, although Timberwolves season is kicking up, my broadcast schedule doesn't usually start till late January for Wolves. So um, I have this kind of space in between where I do more speaking. And so right now I'm just finishing up a leadership series that I'm actually doing with Bell Bank where I'm speak going around the country speaking to their uh, women leadership groups in each market. And it's something I'm really excited about building out because again, it's like having these conversations with women in the workforce and empowering each other uh, has just been really um, a really amazing thing for me to grow into and learn from. And I, and it's kind of my next thing that I'm really trying to do. So trying to create um, kind of like a national leadership series for women um, is kind of the next step. Awesome. How exciting is that? And yeah. we can find you on your um, rethinkthewin.org. Yeah. yeah. If you go to leahbeolson.com, it, it, it will get you to rethink the win and it'll get you, um, I think, to most of my social media too, which um, everything is under like at Leah B. Olson. Don't forget the B because that's part of my name. So, um, so yeah, so if you kind of do at Leah B. Olson, you should be able to find all the social media spaces. 
Perfect. And that's Leah, L-E-A, B. Olson. Um, hit her up on Instagram, Twitter, go to her website, uh, L-E-A, B-O-L-S-E-N. Yes. Com. Thank you. Well, yes. And we will have that in our show notes um, and on our social media um, promoting this show, uh, as well as if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll, you've seen it scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Reach out to Leah. If your company needs someone to come in to motivate and inspire you and your colleagues, Leah V is, is the one, right? She will unlock a lot for you. So um, Leah, thank you so much for joining us today on Unlocking the Club. Yeah, what an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of it. I'm super impressed with everything you're doing, girl. Keep killing it. The feeling is mutual. You're doing some great things as well. And I'll definitely be in touch with you about some tips for uh, not messing up on the broadcast space. <laughs> All right, Levy, we'll get back right. with everything. Okay, bye-bye. Wow. Another amazing conversation um, with Leah B. Olson. So grateful for you all for tuning in and listening to another episode of Unlocking the Club. Grateful to Leah B. Olson for joining me on the, the show today. And one of the things that really resonated with me about this conversation was when Leah talked about being open to learning more. And I think that that really is um, such an important thing. Uh, you hear so often from you know people that are so successful, they talk about being curious of um, craving learning throughout their lives. And I think being open to learning more, whatever magnitude of what that more is, if it is simply learning how to garden or to knit or crochet, or if it's learning a new job or a new role, um, if you are open, there's so many things that you can achieve because you can just trust yourself in the things that you have accomplished throughout your journey and the things that you can leverage the foundation that you have built um, on your journey. So I'm thankful to Leah B for joining me on today's show. Thank you all for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's conversation and you want to keep it going, go ahead over to Facebook and join us on the Cold Breakers Lounge group page. We are going to continue this conversation, talk about unlocking the club and many of the things that Leah shared with us in this conversation. Make sure you're following us on social media at Unlocking the Club and stay tuned for some special things that we have coming up. That's it for today's episode, but until next time, be well. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social media where you'll hear about future guests, access special features, and connect with this amazing community. Head on over there and let us know how you are unlocking the club. Until next time, peace.